Hi, my name is Uri Dahan. Um, this is uh, one of my, uh, I think it's my fifth or sixth time in Australia. Uh, always love coming over here. Uh, weather's usually better, but uh, that, that's how it works out. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, integration. Now, uh, just to kind of get a sense of the audience, who's, uh, who's a .NET developer here? Okay, is there anybody not a .NET developer in here? Okay, we'll lynch you later, okay? <laughs> it's called lunch, but it's pronounced lynch. Uh, so yes, there's the hashtag DDD Sydney. If you want to uh, tweet about the stuff that, that, that I'm putting up over here, feel free to do that. Um, I founded a company called Particular Software a number of years ago. We do and service bus technology, but that's not really what I'm going to be talking about today. Talking more broadly about the concepts of integration and building large-scale distributed systems, complex business logic, uh, and trying to make the systems reliable under all sorts of failure conditions. So. Uh, and, of course, sorry, if you want to tweet me, I'm at Uri Dahan, and uh, I usually try to respond very quickly. So, uh, the first rule of integration, as they say, is, thou shalt not talk about integration. Uh, the thing about integration is, it really is one of those dirty little secrets in software. When we start a greenfield project, everybody is so hopeful, this time we're going to get to do it right, finally. Who's on a greenfield project? They get to start from scratch. Okay, some hands going up. Uh, who's on a code base that's been around for more than two or three years? Okay, the rest of us. And there's always that sense that uh, you know, next time it's going to be better. And uh, if only we could work on a greenfield project, everything would work out great. But integration is one of those things that, that, that tends to creep up on you and don't, you don't really expect it. And, and that's kind of what I'm here to talk about today is, is there's this element that, you know, eventually everybody comes into this world of integration. Uh, but we don't really talk about it much when we talk about uh, design patterns or layered architecture uh, or microservices or that kind of stuff. It's kind of relegated off to the side. It's, it's not a sexy topic uh, so much. And, uh, that's, that, that's kind of the problem. That's why I want to talk about it today. That, that, that's kind of my thing. I, I try to talk about the problems in software that are kind of the, the, the big problems that don't get talked about nearly enough. And uh, in terms of conferences, they're, they're, they're not the new, hip, exciting technology that everybody wants to, to play with. It's kind of more of the, the, the boring day-to-day -day struggles that, that inflict all of us as software developers. So. Uh, in, in many ways, for those of you who have, who's seen Fight Club, by the way, just so that I have an idea of that. Okay, the most, most of you have. Those of you that haven't, you really should. Uh, so that's kind of the problem in software, is that in so much that we don't talk about integration, uh, and it kind of remains as this underground thing, that's what ends up causing mayhem in so many of our software projects. And sometimes it really does blow up in a bad way. Now, to give you a sense of uh, just how broad scale this problem is. Again, one, one last scene from the Fight Club and, and that'll be it. We cook your meals, we haul your trash. Really all of the dirty little things that nobody likes to talk about are ultimately handled by integration code. The dark plumbing code that is kind of a, you know, just make it work and move on. Nobody's really thinking about how do I design this really clean and neat and how do I make this performance uh, stuff work well. It's the make it work and move on. Let's go build some nice clean UI using Xamarin or some other uh, new technology on that. So how did we get into this problem? of integration kind of being snaked all over the place through our software. Now, the interesting thing is that no software project starts off and says, this is going to be my architecture, <laughs> right? However, three to five years later, if I did a poll and said, okay, what does your software architecture look like? Most of the people say, yeah, something like that. And it just sort of happened. So I want to talk a little bit about what forces were at play that ended up causing systems to end up devolving in this type of integration mess. So it usually starts out very simply. Some business stakeholder comes along and says, I need this little thing. 
build me a house for me and my other people and we need this kind of functionality. And it, 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 programmer states, okay, look, you know, I'll build it for you, but just so you know, don't expect this thing to scale, don't expect it to be super duper production ready. Uh, it will do exactly what it says on the tin, but nothing more. And the business is like, yeah, totally cool, that's fine, just build this little thing for me. So you build this little app, you go live, and then, you know, as luck would have it, five weeks later, all of a sudden, you know, their, their, their parents and their cousins and their uncles and their aunts and their friends and everybody's moving and they're like, you know, this is feeling a little bit cramped, can you make it scale? And you're saying, look, I, I told you that it wouldn't scale. I know, I know, but please, just this once, can you somehow <laughs> add a couple of floors somewhere? And you're thinking, you know, how exactly do I take this cute little thing and, and make it scale? And you kind of come up with some sort of kludge. <laughs> of the, you know, we, we kind of put a skyscraper underneath it. It wasn't really planned that way to begin with, but it works. That, that's kind of the first start of the how did we get into this mess. It's the, you know, it wasn't planned, but we made it work. We're not feeling very good about ourselves, but at least we solve the problem and we move on. Now, if only it ended at that, we'd kind of end up with, with, with a contained mess. But it's not a very big mess, it's not a pretty, uh, but it's, it's somewhat contained. And then along the way, there's this element of, look, you know, we kind of want a swimming pool and we want a tennis court. You're like, there's no room. Like, no, make it work and fit it in over here. And uh, we'd like an, an, you know, an expansion for this. And as time progresses, you, you kind of keep twisting and shaping the code into some unholy mess until you end up with one other small change. And, you know, the, the architecture is totally out the window by that point in time. But again, you know, it sort of works. Now, as things progress, you, you kind of take it to the limits of what three dimensions are actually able to, to contain. And then the business comes to you and they say, look, just one more thing, right? That famous Apple slide, you know, just the one more thing. And you know when they give you that one more thing that it's gonna be the straw that breaks the camel's back. That, that, that you've just about done everything possible on this code base in order to cater for those needs. And at some point in time, you'll, you'll hit that threshold where somebody will say these magic words. It would be faster to write the whole thing from scratch than to implement this requirement on top of the existing code base. Who said that before? It would be faster to write it from scratch. Okay, most of the hands going up. Now, just between us developers, no business people are in the room, no management is kind of watching. We'll turn off the recording for a minute so nobody will actually see that you're saying it. Is this a rational, dispassionate analysis that you've done in calculating that it would actually be faster and lower risk to write the thing from scratch? Or is it more of the, I'm just frustrated, I've had enough, this is it? <laughs> is it the frustrated, I've had enough? Yes. Who, when they said this statement, did that from sort of a, a Spock rational analysis perspective? Said, yes, after calculating all of the risk, I have determined that it is actually much faster to do it this way. And some, some hands have got to go up. Yes, okay. There's always a couple of Spocks in the room. <laughs> right? Well, there's people who think they're Spock or like to think they're Spock. Now, I've got some bad news for you. These rewrites... I gotta tell you, they go bad. They go really bad. And the thing is, for those of you that are on the Greenfield projects, most Greenfield projects are a rewrite, right? That's the justification for starting from scratch. It's the, okay, now it's Greenfield, now you can do everything right. L let me talk a little bit about why these types of rewrites go bad. So who's on a rewrite project? Some of the hands are going up, okay. they are lots of fun to start. Rewrite projects are lots of fun to start, but part of the reasons why they go bad is the famous iron triangle of software. 
Um, if you're not familiar, you know, look it up. There's, there's a whole lot of information about it. There's this element of time, scope, and resources uh, that go into any software project. And the, the unnamed quantity in the Iron Triangle is quality. So I'm going to talk briefly about that to explain why exactly is it that rewrite projects go bad. So it starts out with scope, actually. The problem with the rewrite is that the business comes to you and says, you know this thing that we've been working on for the past three, four, five years that everybody's been tweaking and adding features to and fixing bugs on and adding this data and integrating with that other thing? We want you to rewrite all of that. Now, if it was just that, it wouldn't be so bad. But once you start a rewrite project, then they come back to you and say, you know that feature that we asked you? We want that one too, right? Because that's how you justified the rewrite. So it's not just the scope that's in there, it's the features that they wanted to build on top of the old code base that you said couldn't be done. So you gotta do that as a part of the scope as well. Now, there's a certain dynamic that happens around the time component that also relates to the scope which is the, look, you know, we're going to give you a year to rewrite this. But if we're going to wait a year, we don't just want the same thing. We want it to be cloud. We want it to be mobile. We want it to be big data. So it's not exactly the same scope. It kind of starts from the same scope. And then there's the just one more thing, and if you're already doing this, then at the same time, can you also add this other thing? And it's really hard to push back on that scope creep. Because you asked for a rewrite, you got the rewrite, so you kind of feel like you have to give and take a little bit. So you're getting a little bit more scope. But the reality is, a year, in order to build what the organization did in five years before that, you know, the math just doesn't add up. Even if you get all of the developers in the company all working on this rewrite, there's that problem of, you know, adding more developers doesn't instantaneously make you go faster. So you start off and you're all very hopeful on this rewrite project. We're going to do domain-driven design and test-driven development and behavior-driven development and feature-driven development and all the driven developments that there are. BDD, CDD, ADD, every single DD that you can get in there. You know, this time we're going to do it right. And it's going to be microservices and it's going to be NoSQL and we're going to keep the code clean and we're going to refactor as we go. And somewhere at the six month mark out of the one year project, you kind of look at each other and there's this kind of knowing look, this isn't working. <laughs> right? We're not going to make it. Too much functionality. Not enough time. And that's when all of the nice fairy principles kind of fly away and we start hacking the shit out of the code. <laughs> just, it's really at that point, anything goes. Just, you know, bam, get the features out as quickly as possible. You know, we need to refactor later, <laughs> right? No refactoring. What about testing? Later, right? All of the DDs just gone. Now, th th there is this, th there's a certain element of the, the kind of momentary sadness of the loss of the dream, right? Because this time was supposed to be different and now we realize it's not going to be different. Now, the problem is that you get to the end of the year, you haven't actually built everything that the business asked for. And the, the, the really bad thing about it, it's not your fault, but you still feel like you failed, right? Bec because you entered into this contract knowingly. You were the one that said it would be faster to write the whole thing from scratch, right? You put your reputation on the line. The business didn't come to you and say, hey, can you write this thing for, from scratch for me? You said it. So there's that element of, you know, it's, it's a personal failing that, that we feel really bad about. Now, 
so you get towards the end of the year, you don't, you, you haven't really replaced all of the functionality. You got some things working, which is good. Some other things are still buggy. Some features that you don't, that, that you can't actually get, get done in time. And at that point in time, the resource constraints start to hit you. Because you see, the business has been waiting patiently for a whole year in which they have not received any new functionality in production while you've been doing this big rewrite. Around about the year mark, they're starting to get a little bit antsy. They're like, you know, when are we going to be able to get something? And you're like, soon, soon. And another month goes by and another two months goes by and they're like, look, you know, um, we really need something quick. So you're like, okay, um, you know, these two developers, I, I, I think we can work without them. Can you guys go back to the existing big ball of mud? and help prop the business up in the meantime. And you kind of drag that on for another couple of months and the business is like, you know, where's our functionality? And you're like, soon, soon, and it's been already a year and a half. And the business and management, they're, they're, they're not looking very kindly on this big rewrite project anymore. And they start stealing a few more developers away. And as the number of resources that you've got on this project dwindle, the progress dwindles. And at a certain point in time, there's this recognition of we're not, we're just not going to be able to replace the existing big ball of mud with this new thing. And that's when it hits you that you're, when you can't replace the old thing, you can't actually launch the new thing because the new thing is built on the principle that there will be a wholesale replacement of the old. Once you recognize there's a certain sinking feeling of, wait, so we're going to have to run the new thing alongside the old thing? But this has a totally different data model than that thing over there. If we have to run these things side by side, they actually need to talk to each other. And then there's this moment of recognizing that your world is just collapsing. It's like, oh my god. Now we have to do integration. And it's not like a little bit. This is not like, okay, we're going to be calling an API and, and that's it. It is the, 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 the dream has now just exploded into a million little pieces. Because now you need to figure out all of the ways that your new data model is going to have to map to the old crappy data model and to have your UI work alongside the old UI and to have your business logic call into existing functionality in the old one. And now you start stringing all those millions of lines of electrical cables from one to the other. And that's going to take you easily another half a year it's just so that you can deploy your existing, the, the, the new code base that you've been working on for the past year and a half alongside the existing code base. Now, for those of you that are consultants, who here is a consultant? We've got some consultants in the room. This is around the point in time where we bail, <laughs> right? We've built the new thing. Now you need to integrate it with the old thing. We did not sign up for that. So it's like, good luck, Godspeed. <laughs> Bye -bye. My work here is done. And a lot of times consultants are brought in on these type of rewrite projects, you know, we need more staff, we need to rewrite this big thing. All right, this is going to be a temporary effort for a year. We're going to bring some people in, and then, you know, afterwards they'll, you know, they'll finish their contract and, and off they'll go. And then you have the poor staff developers that are left dealing with this god awful mess, doing that kind of integration work. And of course, you know, you've got the new system, you've got the old system. You can't necessarily do synchronous rest communication between everything all the time. Eventually, somebody starts rolling up their sleeves and starts pulling out the SSIS packages and the batch jobs, and we start shuttling data around. And again, it's just the god-awful integration work that we hoped that we'd not have to do this time. But it ended up that, yes, this time as well, we ended up with that. And you know, we're two and a half years into a one-year project. And you know, at, 
at that point of time, it kind of goes back to business as usual of fixing bugs and working on, an, on another god-awful code base and building up reports that now need to pull data from two systems instead of just one system and dealing with all of the data inconsistencies. So all sorts of bad things happen to rewrite projects. So for those of you that are just starting on one, uh, good morning, <laughs> right? Now, for, your, for our users, it's not really any better. At the end of the day, they, they end up with two systems, two UIs, what's known as, from the end user's perspective, swivel chair integration. I don't know if you've heard that term, where they have two monitors, and they're just kind of doing something on one, and then they swivel over here, and then they do something, and then they do. If you've ever been, as a customer, on the phone with a call center, that is what's going on over there. When they're saying, just one minute, it's kind of like this 360 degree thing that they're doing as they're going through all of the systems and retyping and reconnecting all of the information uh, to make sure that what you ask them to do, which seemed like a very simple request, uh, I would like to record the fact that I have moved from one place to another, yes, just one second, and they have to type that into 15 different systems. Why is that? Because of 15 rewrite projects that happened in the organization over the years. So. There's always the problem with the batch jobs. Who's had a batch job fail on them once? A batch job fail? Or, no, 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 that's actually, who has had a batch job never fail on them? Okay, nobody. And that's the problem, that these batch jobs that really are the thing that make sure that all of the data remains consistent in the organization are this kind of brittle thing that most of the time it works, but when it doesn't work, it just sort of dies quietly. And then users start saying, hey, you know, what's going on? Data's out of sync. Somebody looks in the log files. Oh, yeah, you know, uh, we had a batch job fail. Uh, 24,000 exceptions were logged. <laughs> the administrator looks at that and says, clear all. <laughs> it, it's just too many, right? It's, you, you, you cannot resolve a problem of that scale. You know, put yourself in the shoes of an administrator. You know, every Monday morning you come in to tens of thousands of failed whatevers. Like, you know, what are you going to do? Hey, you know, just call up a developer. Say, hey, this is, it's your problem now. Right? I, I kept the servers running. You make sure that they actually do what they're supposed to do. So anytime one of these things fails or takes longer to run, that ends up wreaking havoc across the organization. And the organization limps along. Uh, eventually, a new CIO is brought in. Uh, some more architects are brought in, somebody looks at the existing mess, three years later someone says, you know, it would just be faster to write this whole thing from scratch <laughs> than to continue maintaining things as they are. And because it's a new set of people, they don't recognize that that's how we got into this mess to begin with. So everybody makes this mistake once, at least. After you've been through it once or twice, um, well, here's the upside. You know, it, it's kind of the benefit of experience. Once you know that a project is going to fail, it's actually a very freeing experience. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't really matter what I do here. This thing is going to go belly up anyway. And that's when a different kind of driven development takes hold. You're probably familiar with it if you're at this conference. It's called resume-driven development. <laughs> right? the, what technology am I missing from my resume? <laughs> Cassandra. I haven't used Cassandra yet on a project. This seems like the perfect project for it. We're doing a rewrite anyway, so, right? Cassandra. F sharp. I've always wanted to learn F sharp. <laughs> And of course, you know, once you make a decision, it's very easy to justify it after the fact. Oh no, it's a functional programming language. Everything's immutable. It's going to scale. You bring out all sorts of articles from MSDN and you know, uh, Phil Trelford and all these guys that are going to say, oh no, F Sharp is totally the language of the future. So it's very easy to justify it, especially to a CIO that wants to leave their mark, right? And you know, I've, I've heard of companies that everything is being written in F-sharp, and more power to them. Uh, but it is just 
resume-driven development, which is great. Again, for those of us that are consultants, we live on this stuff. How do you think we keep up to date? <laughs> right? One rewrite project after another, you're just constantly polishing your skills. You don't ever actually have to deliver any real business value. That's for the poor <laughs> schmucks that are employed by the company. Right? So, when all is said and done in all of these integration projects, and again, back to the Fight Club reference, the system that we end up with, it ain't pretty. It, it really is, you know, you just sort of pound, pound the code into submission, and whatever ends up working, you know, that's, that's what we do. Now, along the way, there's this element of, okay, so how exactly are we going to, at a technical, practical level, start doing all of the integration between the pieces? So you got your usual solutions where you've got your, your JSON and your HTTP gets and puts and posts and rests, and then you've got your old school web services and WCF, and it's really just you know, getting all of the things across. So after you've done all of this type of point-to-point -point integration, to get things working, uh, eventually someone draws a diagram of the architecture and it looks something like this. With this app to that app and all of the connections going every which way between the external services and the internal services, someone says, you know what, this isn't good. This, the, this, is, this point to point integration is, is just not scalable. We need a, a better, more standardized solution. We need an API gateway. We need a service bus. We need something to solve all of these integration needs, and then our architecture will magically look like this. <laughs> Pay no attention to all of the lines behind the rectangle, <laughs> right? So that's, that's the trick, is you just put a nice big rectangle down the middle. Uh, this diagram actually isn't as good as I'd want it to be, because you really want the lines to be at right angles. Right? Because if, if they're at, at an angle, it doesn't look as architecturally solid. There's something <laughs> visually satisfying about having everything sort of perfectly leveled. If you got kind of angles that are coming in, people start to wonder if you actually have something like that behind the scenes. Uh, but that's kind of the problem with the, okay, we're not going to do point-to-point -point integration. We're going to create a reusable set of this or a service busy that or an API gateway for this. And it, it never actually ends up working out as well as we want. Now, this type of approach is the, instead of rewriting the systems, we're just going to focus on rewriting the integration wiring between everything and everything else. Now, Again, circling back to more of the technical side of things. When starting down this path of point-to-point -point integration, so before we get to this kind of mess at the point where somebody says we want to do this, the point-to-point -point integration really starts out very simple, where all you need to do is you just you know, grab a REST service, invoke a method on it, pass some data into it, and you get a response and you move on. And then you call another REST service, and then you orchestrate a couple more of those, and then you return a response to your client. You know, nobody starts out saying, this is the architecture that I'm going to create. Every mess always started out as a very set of simple calls between a couple of systems. So as you start down this path of saying, OK, we're going to connect this thing, and we're going to connect that thing, we're going to connect that thing, before you get into the technological mess, I want to talk a little bit about the reliability mess because that is one of the things that doesn't get brought up enough. As developers, we have a very strong sense of when does the code become unmaintainable, but we don't have nearly as strong a sense of when the code actually stops being reliable. And I want to talk a little bit about that because when you end up with a system whose data you can't trust, then it is that much harder for us as developers to try to resolve those problems. Now, I want to mention what are the kinds of problems that we end up with in production that start off with code that is really this simple. So in a production environment, when you have a client that is calling some service and that service is talking to some database, and you got data that's kind of flowing in and you're 
wrapping up all of those calls and transactions, and you're updating some data here and you're creating some data over there. The bad problem that doesn't get talked about nearly enough is the fact that servers tend to crash every once in a while. Sometimes it's that your process recycles. Sometimes it's that Windows decides to crap out on you. Sometimes it's that you actually have a physical hardware reset. But for whatever reason, every once in a while in a production environment, processes die. Now, the question is, what, action, what happens to your system? What happens to the data when one of these types of predictable type of failures occurs? Well, if you didn't complete the transaction, the database is eventually going to roll back. So it remains in a consistent state. Now, any memory that you had on your web server while you were doing that transaction also disappears. And now you have a client that has invoked some sort of REST API, and they're sitting there and the request times out. So they don't have a request, they don't have a response. The data that they submitted is kind of still sitting there. It's not on the server, it's not in the database. And then what do developers do when you get, what, what, what do you do when you get an exception? You've invoked some service and you get a timeout. Who logs the fact that there was an exception? Okay. Who does anything else besides logging the fact that there was an exception? So, so, some hands going up. Who retries? Okay. The problem with retrying is that sometimes you're retrying against a failed server, so it's just a, you know, try to call it again and it's not there. And then you put in a configurable number of retries because that's a best practice. Lots of best practices out there. And hopefully it ends up working. So for those of you that, 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 that did that code, you put the little bit of a catch web exception in there. Say, all right, you know, we recognize sometimes things fail, we'll log the fact and then we'll try again. Now, if again, your, your production environment is able to stand up again quickly enough, then that solves everything. The server comes back up or the load balancer directs your web request to a different server and then you're able to make the request, have it go through, all of the transactions are done, life's a peach. Until somebody says, you know what, you know, we need to not just talk to a database, we have to call some other service. We have a larger orchestration. Why? Because of all of the integration messes that we were talking about before. So what happens when even if you include retries, you need to talk not only to database, but to some other service over HTTP as a part of your processing logic. And let's face it, you know, we kind of do this all the time. So in this new microservices world, this is actually becoming the, the, the common architectural state of affairs. It's the one microservice is calling multiple other microservices, which in turn are calling multiple other microservices. And that's supposed to be good. So let me talk about what happens when you try to integrate multiple microservices together in an environment that isn't perfectly 100% highly available all the time. So same scenario as before, you got data that's flowing into your service, you're getting some of that data into your database, and you have some sort of more intelligent orchestration here that after you do an insert into the database, you take that database identifier and you pass it to that other service, right? Put an entity in my database, tell them, hey, I did something with this entity. They go perform some logic, they return you some other identifier back, and you go to save that in your database. Fairly common standard type of microservices integration. Some database work, some remote calls. Now. As long as everything is running, this works great. But the scenario that I want you to think about is, well, what happens if we crash somewhere in the middle of this? So same scenario as before, right? Trying to get the data in, calling the database, made the call successfully to that HTTP service, but before we were able to save the identifier that we got back into our database, something bad happened to our server. It happens. Luckily, we've got our retry logic, right? So database is going to roll back because we didn't complete the transaction. 
But when we try to actually think about what happens at a whole system level, that service that we're talking to, it doesn't roll back, right? We don't have the ability to enlist all of these services in one big gigantic transaction. So when we do a retry, what happens? So assuming that we're able to connect to a server that now is actually running and is not going to crash midway through, then we invoke the HTTP call again. We insert this time, it's a different record into the database, right? The database gives us back a different database generated identifier. So if on our first attempt, the database gave us ID 123, when we do the second call, we get ID 124. Or if there were other transactions in the meantime, maybe 136. And then we turn around and we call that HTTP service and say, hey, do something with ID 136. And of course, from its perspective, that's a perfectly valid request. And then it performs that second call as well as what it did on the first call. So while your process works the second time, and you're thinking, oh, okay, great, the retry resolved everything for me, because there wasn't the rollback, now you end up with some service that has a record in it, entity 123, that does not exist in your database. Right, we all see that? The first attempt passed an identifier that didn't end up in our database. The second attempt actually worked and we had the record in our database and in the other service. So now we end up in a situation where some of these services in our organization have information about entities that might not exist somewhere else. Now, you know, if that was the specific problem, it wouldn't have been so bad because we could have uncovered it. We could have found out that there is a record 124 over here without a corresponding 124 over there. The issue is that when things crash, the database, when you call it again, create, it, it does fill in that spot, right? When you have a sequential identifier in a database, the fact that it fails and rolls back, the next insert is actually going to give you that same one. So it could end up being that it's not that you don't have the database record in there, but that the database is pointing to a different entity that is related to a different concept, a different record, a different customer, a different product, a different patient. So it's not that you have a problem of a record in a service that doesn't have a corresponding record in your database. The issue that you have is that you have a record in a service that is now pointing to an incorrect record in your database. That type of data level inconsistency is really hard to track down. So as developers, we're like, well, there was an exception. We retried. It worked the next time. My mission here is done. But the reality is that it creates these problems for inconsistent connections between data across multiple services. So as you're building the system, as you're testing it, none of these problems actually occur. When you have to end up in production, again, for the most part, everything works fine. But occasionally, the system ends up with these types of inconsistent connections. So users are saying, hey, you know, something's weird with the system. The data's, data's wrong. And then, you know, they tell us that and we say, really? And then we test it, I don't know, it works on my machine. <laughs> so the problem is we don't have a system that is consistently inconsistent, right? It is sporadically inconsistent. Under sort of odd edge cases, it ends up being somewhat garbaged up with this data. And every time the users come to us and say, I think there's a bug with the system, our answer is, does not reproduce. <laughs> and we close the issue. And, and that's part of the problem, that we end up creating systems whose data can't really be trusted. And then the business needs to compensate with all sorts of manual processes. And they come back to us and say, OK, look, you know, if you're not able to to solve or prevent this problem in the system itself, 
Now what you need to do is to write a batch job that's going to be trawling through the data across all of the services to try to find these inconsistencies and correct them. So then you're writing more code to try to deal with the problems that the first bit of code caused. But you continue writing the same sort of code over and over and over again. So the question is, well, what do we do about this? First and foremost, and that, that's kind of what I try to do when I'm talking to people, is to recognize this is happening. This is reality. This is the kind of world that we've ended up creating along the way uh, through a series of rewrites and attempts to do REST-based integration, HTTP-based integration, without recognizing the fundamental flaws in that approach. So what do we do? Last Fight Club reference, I think. Uh, we need to start over. We really need to, to tear things down and start over from really basic principles. Now, uh, those basic principles, and, and it's something that uh, it, it, it's hard to, to get that message across to someone who hasn't yet experienced it. But HTTP-centric integration, although it's used all over the place, is fundamentally unreliable. And we need to move to a very different style that can help reduce and prevent these problems from occurring. And part of that is using queuing technology. So yes, I'm biased as somebody who has uh, is kind of standing here saying, hey, look, use my service bus technology, use queuing technology. The thing is that the only reason I ended up creating in service bus roughly 10 years ago was because I had been through all of these types of elements of pain and I was talking to people far more experienced than myself, said, how do we solve these problems? And they kind of looked at me disparagingly like, you've never heard of a queue? And I felt kind of stupid. And, no, I'm sorry, I haven't. Like, they've been around for years, you know, back from the, the good old MQ series days in IBM. And ever since then, every single platform ends up creating a type of queuing platform. It's kind of like a duh. Like, sorry, nobody told me this. I, yeah, I was on MSDN. There wasn't any comments about queues. <laughs> Went to a conference, nobody's talking about queues. I called you and you're going to the wrong conferences. Like, okay, so which conferences do I go to? Like, we don't go to conferences anymore. <laughs> it's like, well, thanks, but how do I go about learning this stuff? So I ended up learning a lot of this stuff myself along the way and recognizing that, you know what, this whole element of just use a queue, uh, it's actually not as trivial as it sounds. So who's used a queue before? RabbitMQ, MSMQ, ActiveMQ, some, okay, good, lots of you have, that's great. When I got started out, it was like, oh, okay, you know, the, 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 the first queue that I'd end up using was something that was on a horrific programming language called Ada. And, um, and the organization was in the midst of an upgrade to Ada 95. It was gonna be amazing. Uh, but a lot of that system was built on the concept of mailboxes in Ada. So that was my first exposure to actually using queues. And then from that, you know, in the late 90s, then Microsoft released MSMQ, which was total shit. Uh, but, you know, they, to give Microsoft some credit, every single version one product that Microsoft has released has been pretty shit. Uh, <laughs> right? So they're consistent. <laughs> right? You can count on it. And for those of you, is anybody using in service bus here? Okay, some hands going up. And all the time people are saying, Udi, when is in service bus going to support .NET Core? I'm like, guys, that's 1.0 technology. <laughs> Seriously, you know, take a look at some history. When is it going to support it? Not until it gets to 2.0, because then, you know, then there's at least a chance it's going to work. Not to say bad things about not .NET Core, uh, but you know, it's, it's standard Microsoft fare, right? Microsoft people doing the best that they can. 1.0 technology tends to be fairly brittle. So, and regardless of whichever queuing technology that you're, that you're using, um, it, it is more difficult to get all of the bits and bobs lined up than it may appear when you get started. So you go to a, que a queuing systems website, RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ, MSMQ, Azure storage queues, whatever, 
and you run the samples and everything works perfectly. But you know what? Same thing happened with HTTP, right? Works on my machine, but to make it production ready requires knowledge and awareness of a whole lot of little things. So for example, that element of distributed transactions. Now when, when I got started with queues, there were no such thing as distributed transactions. Those came later. So the kinds of things that we had to do to work without distributed transactions were really quite difficult. When distributed transactions came along, it simplified everything. It meant that when messages came into a queue, and then when we ended up processing those messages, we could enlist the queue into the same transaction as our business logic code that was talking to a database. And if any bad thing happened anywhere through the process, not only would the database roll back, but the queue would automatically roll back as well. And we didn't have to write any custom code to handle that. We just enlisted all of those things into the same distributed transaction and everything sorted itself out perfectly. So no data was lost. The client didn't need to resubmit. And at that point in time, because the message was back in the queue, the retries happened automatically. So you didn't actually have to do any fancy logic in order to have the client resubmit the request. The message was back in the queue. And then your code just comes back to the queue. And the message is still there. You go and reprocess it, and everything works. Now, since then, distributed transactions have fallen out of favor. So in order to get something like this to work, which means that the database ends up being consistent with the queue and you don't have any other concerns around that, there's a whole lot more detailed work that you need to do, and I don't have the time to get into that right now. But I want to talk about the scenario that we were talking about before, where HTTP ran into problems and retries didn't resolve it, and that's when, as a part of our logic, we needed to call out to a third-party service. Right? That's where we had the problem around the consistency. So as long as you're just pulling off a message from a queue, talking to a database, that's relatively simple. But when you want to talk to some third-party service, you actually have to follow a very specific pattern. So if you try to call that service directly from your message queue code, you won't end up with a consistent result. You need to have some logic internally that when you're going to call the service, you don't call it directly, you send a message to another endpoint and that thing is gonna call the service for you. All right, so for those of you, all of you that raised your hands that said you're using queuing systems, make sure that if you need to integrate with a third party service, that you don't do that in the same code that's talking to the database. All right, so the rule of thumb is in a given section of code, you can pick two resources to talk to. That's a queue in a database, that's cool. A queue in a web service, that's cool. A web service in a database, but then no queue and no other services, that's cool. You start mixing up three things, reliability and consistency go out the window. So always keep that in mind. You know, pick your two resources wisely. So when going and, and doing a scenario where you need to call some third party service, as a part of your logic, you send a message instead of calling that service directly. Now the thing about sending a message is that you do that, that that gets done asynchronously, meaning that the message finishes its processing, goes and talks to the database, and then the transaction can commit. Now the, the interesting thing, the appropriate property about a queuing system that you don't have with HTTP is that when you ask to send a message, the message doesn't get sent right away it gets buffered by the queuing system, which means that if I inserted an item into my database and I got back a database generated ID and I put that database generated ID in a message, if that transaction fails, if the database rolls back, then what happens is the database comes back to its previously consistent state. The first message rolls back to the queue, and the most important property is that any messages that I ask to be sent are also rolled back as well. Which means that there isn't any case where a phantom identifier ends up ex um, escaping from this bounded context. So that when I try again, 
and the message gets reprocessed. And then I, I go and get the database generated identifier and I ask to send the message that I can have a guarantee that if my database transaction is going to succeed, then the message is going to go out. And if my database transaction does not succeed, then the message will not go out. Which means that when that message ultimately does get delivered, when that web service ultimately does get called, I have a guarantee that the identifiers that are sent to that service are going to be exactly the same as the identifiers that I have in my database. And once we have all of that, that way we can build a highly reliable system, even under the case where there are all kinds of failures. Now, in order to make something like this work, to say that, oh, just use a queuing system, just use a database, you have to set up the queuing system properly. So for those of you that are programming directly against a queuing system, you need to make sure that you use the exact same transaction or lease object when you're pulling a message off the queue as when you're asking to send messages to the queue in the same context. So if you're passing along the same lease object, assuming that the queuing system actually supports this functionality of message in, message out as a part of the same logical transaction, then this problem is solved for you. In the case where it doesn't, and I can rattle off a handful of queuing systems that don't support this kind of functionality, then you need to do something quite a bit more intelligent. And that's where uh, features like the outbox pattern that we have in in-service bus are there to solve that problem for you. Where in essence what we do is that when your code asks to send a message, we start buffering them in a transactional durable way so that you never end up in a situation where the phantom messages end up exiting even though the queuing system doesn't support transactions. I'm talking about RabbitMQ, for example, Azure Service Bus, for example, all of these types of environments, whether you're on the cloud or on premise, these types of problems are not fully sorted out. They're great libraries, they're strong queuing systems, but they're not necessarily built to handle this higher level of reliability and consistency. Now, I've been hounding the RabbitMQ and the Azure team for years. This is not, I'm, I'm not trying to come here and say, look, use in service, but I would much rather to say, look, all of the queuing serv services solve this problem out of the box. You don't even need to worry about it. You don't need an end service bus. I don't like writing infrastructure code. Okay, I'd much rather, you know, most of my career was as a consultant, working with clients, building business systems. I'd much rather spend my time solving real problems from the business, for the business rather than having to roll infrastructure so that other people can solve problems for businesses. So you know, I've been talking to the Azure guys, say, hey, can you support this? It's been five years and they haven't supported it yet. RabbitMQ's gotten a little bit better over time. It's still missing out a bunch of this stuff. What's interesting, again, MSMQ, one of the older, uh, cruftier pieces of database to, uh, of queuing technology, tends to support all this stuff out of the box. Most people don't like MSMQ because it's old, it's difficult to manage. Then they go and use RabbitMQ, which is new and much more difficult to manage. <laughs> but at least it looks better on your resume than MSMQ, right? Like, you know, what queuing technologies do you know? MSMQ, yeah, that's old, we don't use that. What else do you know? ADA, I've never heard of ADA. RabbitMQ, oh yes, we like people with RabbitMQ. So, um, I know that I've, I've kind of scratched the surface of a lot of the problems of integration, mentioned some of the solution patterns for it. Uh, I can't really do service to, uh, to the breadth of this problem in the context of a, a one hour keynote. But what I've been able to do is, for those of you who don't know, I run a five-day class in which I talk about all this kind of stuff in a great deal of detail. Uh, we've had that recorded, and there are two full days of those videos that are now available online. And uh, I've convinced the powers that be that uh, we can uh, get you access to that. So there's the URL and the access code for getting those two days of video. It includes topics like the fallacies of distributed computing, uh, for those of you who've heard about the fallacies of distributed computing and are interested in learning more, uh, there's actually a, a book that we have at the particular table over there, so you can grab that. It's also available in ebook form. So I talk about that in these two days of video. 
Uh, there's also messaging patterns and PubSub and uh, loose coupling and all of the, let's call it the basic level of building queue-based message-driven systems. So uh, I hope that that will give you the follow-on information uh, from this presentation if you found this interesting. And uh, as always, I'm available over Twitter for follow-up conversations. I'm going to be here almost till the end of the day, and then I've got to fly back home. Uh, thank you so much for having me and your attention. It's great. Thank you. Thank you.